Okay, once again, we'll be having um, Mikhail Lulakis talking about metastability in supercritical symmetric zero range processes. Thank you. Uh, an immense pleasure to be among uh, dear colleagues and friends after almost three years. And I would like to thank the to take the opportunity to thank the organizers for the invitation and for uh, putting together this very stimulating event. I'm going to talk about uh, metastability in supercritical symmetric zero range process. It's a joint work with uh, Ines Armendariz, who is there, and Stefan Bruskinski, who is uh, in Augsburg, hopefully uh, attending the talk from there. Um, so this is the last talk of the, of the conference, so we are all very tired. So I have also tried to keep the level of technicality at the minimum level. So let's start. You have already seen uh, zero range processes many times in this, many times in this uh, workshop. So I'll be brief. You have a system of interacting parts moving on a, on a set, lambda. And uh, the way they interact is that the holding time at its uh, site depends on the number of particles uh, sitting at its site through a function g that also may change from side to side. So we call it gx. Okay, so if you have k particles sitting at the site, then the time it takes for one of them to leave is exponential with rate uh, gx of k. And then when the clock rings, one of these clocks rings, the particle chooses uh, a target site according to probability law and uh, jumps there and the process starts afresh. And you can write also the, the generator of the process. Uh, you have seen it quite a few times already in this uh, uh, workshop. So uh, the zero range process was introduced in the 70s by Spitzer. In the beginning, it was uh, interesting because it was, um, so to speak, a paradigm for proving the hydrodynamic limit for uh, gradient systems uh, of interacting particles using the entropy method. Uh, but uh, over the last uh, couple of decades, decades <laughs> uh, it has been um, studied a lot as a model for condensation. So there are two ways that uh, condensation can occur in such systems. One of them you have seen already in the talk by Sunder last Monday. Okay. So spatial heterogeneity. So if you have slow sites somewhere, these tend to accumulate particles and then you can have condensation. Uh, but there is also a second way. And uh, this has to do with choosing the rate function G decreasing. The rate at which you jump away is decreasing. That means that the more particles you have at the site, the harder it is to get away from that site. And that's an effective mechanism of attraction that can lead to condensation. And there is a standard model that uh, the community uses to, to study condensation in this context. And it's, it's proposed, it was proposed by Evans. And the rate function is uh, given by this form. One can uh, already understand that um, there is condensation at the level of the invariant measures. So let's take a few minutes to talk about the equilibria of, of these uh, models. So Ines talked about uh, these measures a lot yesterday. and. Uh, provided every detail. So I will just briefly remind, uh, recall what uh, she did. So you can find the family of invariant product measures. In fact, they have this form. Uh, notice that this uh, weight function WK decays polynomially. And of course, for these to be probability measures, the partition has, function has to be finite. So for this uh, series to converge, phi has to be less than or equal one. So for phi less than or equal one, we have a family of, of uh, invariant measures. They are product measures. and uh, one way to think about this uh, parameterization is through density, because one can compute the density under these invariant measures, uh, call it a uh, row of phi. It's an increasing function of, of phi, strictly increasing. So you can think that uh, these measures are parameterized by density. And uh, an interesting aspect of, of the, the Evans model is that when B is bigger than two, then the, um, there is only up, uh, um, there is an upper bound in the density that we can reach. Okay, so the highest density we can reach using these measures is finite. Okay, so we call this the critical density. And uh, notice that the critical density is the density at the critical phi, the critical fugacity, so to speak, which is one. So notice that at the critical density, these uh, invariant measures have polynomial tails. So look at this formula, phi is one here, z of phi is a constant. So uh, 
the tails of these measures decay polynomially. This, this will be important for the future. We want to study condensation in these models. So the idea is to start with a system on L sites, put their N particles, and uh, see what the invariant measures of the, this process is. Like when we fix the number of particles, we get an irreducible chain. So there is, a, on a finite state, there, there is a state space. There is a unique invariant measure. One can write it down but it's easier to conceive it as a conditioned measure. So take any of these, um, any of these product measures that we saw earlier. Uh, the answer, the, the right-hand side, in fact, is independent of phi. And if you condition the total number of particles being N, you get the invariant measures of the zero range process on L sites with uh, N particles. There is a tremendous difference when the density we are trying to impose is subcritical or supercritical. So we saw earlier that there is only, a, these product measures exist only up to a critical density. So if you try to impose on your system a, a density that is subcritical, in fact, what you're trying to impose here is a condition that is typical under some of the existing phi's. So you expect to have an equivalence of ensembles and the conditional measures at the thermodynamic limit will converge to the product measures. Okay. And this is the case for the subcritical density. On the other hand, if you try to impose a supercritical density, it's not obvious what will happen. Okay. There is no uh, such measure, nu phi, for which the condition you're trying to impose is typical. So you are conditioning on a rare event. No matter what phi you choose, you're conditioning on a rare event. So, um, what happens in this case was uh, proved by Gorskinski, Schutz, and Spohn uh, in 2003, the thermodynamic limit, and then later by uh, Ferrari, Landim, and Cisco for a finite uh, L. And then uh, in essence, I added some uh, further understanding for the thermodynamic li limit, and uh, for which I would like to take a minute to, to talk about. So uh, this is the picture that you have. So when B is bigger than two, you see that, uh, above a critical density, the system is in a state like this. So there is a um, one side that has most uh, a significant part of the mass in the system. And then there is uh, the rest of the mass is uh, distributed in the bulk. Whereas in the, uh, in this, in the left region, um, there is not a, a single site that has markedly uh, greater occupation number than the others. Okay, so in the, one can prove, in fact, it's not very hard, that in the fluid phase, the maximum occupancy is of the order of logarithm of L. And in the condensed phase, of course, uh, the maximum occupancy is uh, rho minus rho CR. So you can understand this because um, this equivalence of ensembles tells you that the bulk is, so to, less, uh, so to speak, um, distributed according to the invariant measures at the critical density. So typically, a bulk site has rho C particles. So rho CL particles are in the bulk and then the rest rho minus rho CL are um, on one side. So as I said earlier, the, the difference between these two pictures can be explained by how um, large deviations of, uh, for sums of uh, heavy tailed variables are realized. So you probably know Gibbs conditioning principle and you know that when you have a sum and you try to impose a, a, an atypical value to this sum, what will happen is that all the sum and will change a bit so that the condition you are trying to impose be, becomes now um, typical. Okay. And in a way that the relative entropy with respect to the initial distribution is minimized. Okay. This is what happens when you have exponential moments. When you don't have exponential moments, the picture is completely different. So new lambda n is the, the conditional measure. So when you are super critical, this conditional measure in total variation is close to this measure on the right, which can be described in very simple terms. Like, what is this measure? Randomize a position among the, the L positions that you have available. Okay. And then when you choose randomly one of them, how do you choose your distribution? Distribute the particles on all other sides according to the product measures at critical fugacity, and then put the rest of the mass at the site you chose. What is striking in this result is that you get independence of all the bulk sites up to L minus one. This is also in contrast to the 
uh, Gibbs conditioning principle for um, variables that satisfy Kramer's condition. When do you, in, 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 in Gibbs condition principle for uh, variables with exponential moments, what happens is that if you look at a finite system, in the limit, you regain uh, the product structure. But if you look at a, a large window, what happens is that, okay, you, you can get independence for a large window, a diverging size window, but the window has to be much smaller compared to the size of the system. And in particular, it's wrong if the window is of the same order as the size of the system. Okay. Whereas here we see that all L minus one variables become independent in the limit. Okay. So this is what explains the picture we saw earlier. So uh, now we can imagine how the, the configuration space looks like. So there are L, uh, so to speak, wells where the system uh, wants to, to be. And uh, each well is uh, associated with a single site. And what happens in every of these wells? All the other variables look like independent uh, components at the grid capacity. And there is one variable that has a large number of particles, order of rho minus rho. Okay. So in this picture, these blue uh, dots represent the parts of the state space that correspond to these, to these uh, different wells. And the intermediate space is called delta. The invariant measures, what, what the result I described you earlier says is that the invariant measure is concentrated on these uh, blue dots. When we start our system with uh, any configuration, we expect that we will see uh, something like uh, this picture in the limit. Okay, now, um, because we have this result for uh, L minus one particles, it's easy to understand also the fluctuations of the, of the maximum, because the maximum is nothing but N minus the sum of independent random variables, and also the size of the second biggest component. And this is uh, crucial later when we want to get estimates for capacities. Our choices of, uh, of wells um, are informed by these uh, results. So let's take the system and uh, imagine that we evolve it. And um, there are several time scales that are relevant here. Uh, uh, before I go on, perhaps I should uh, tell that the same picture uh, applies if you have a fixed number L of sites. L doesn't have to be divergent. If you have a fixed number of sites, the same result holds. This is the result of, uh, of Claudio, uh, Pablo, and Cisco. OK, good. And, um, so regarding time scales, Ines yesterday described the, the smallest time scale at which there is action. So on time scale N, as Ines described, what happens is that uh, particles uh, leave the, um, the sites that are not of maximal measure and go to the sites that are, uh, have maximal measure under the measure of the underlying walk. So, and then at the second time scale, this is the result of uh, Joel Beltran, uh, Claudio, and Milton, what happens is that you have coarsening. So these, uh, these uh, sites uh, exchange particles, and it can be described uh, as a Bessel type process absorbed at the boundaries. This happens at order n square, on scale n square. Um, at even larger time scales, what one expects to see, you see, this is an irreducible chain. Okay, so it has to go through all configurations from time to time. So if you are somewhere in these wells, then after some time, you are bound to find yourself in another of these wells. So what we want to understand is the time scales at which this motion happens, and also to describe, find an effective description, so to speak, about the, this motion. So how long it takes to jump from, from, from well to well, and if one can say something about this, this uh, motion. So what we expect is that uh, the system weakly reaches one of these wells. And then after being in uh, such a well, it will stay there for a long time. For, uh, for the, if you are on the system and observing the system, when you are in one of these wells, you feel that you are in equilibrium okay? because uh, it's almost an equilibrium. Okay, but it's not. 
Okay, so you have, but you have to wait for much longer to see that in fact you are not in equilibrium, and that there are uh, other spaces, other parts of the space to explore. As I said, the question we want to answer is what are the relevant time scales for the motion of the condensate first, and then uh, how can we describe the the motion of the condensate if if this is possible? Okay, good. So this uh, problem falls into a category of problems called metastability. Metastability is exactly this, uh, this uh, condition where a system is at a, uh, so to speak, a state that is, looks like equilibrium, but it's not, because there is another equilibrium that uh, um, in order to be reached takes much longer time. So this uh, kind of problems was proposed by the physicists uh, Lebovitz and Penrose in the 70s. In the mathematical setting, there have been many, many works and also from people in this room, uh, many works. Uh, but I, I will just mention the, in my opinion, the landmarks of, of the evolution. So uh, in the beginning, there was a pathwise approach, Cassandro, Galvez, Oliveri, and Vares in the 80s. Uh, there was a breakthrough in the around 2000 by Bouvier and uh, his group, Echo, Gerard, Klein. Uh, where we use potential theoretic techniques to study uh, metastability. And uh, in the beginning of the last uh, decade, uh, there was um, a program proposed by Joel Beltran and Claudio, the so-called Martingale approach to metastability. Uh, the Martingale approach uses idea from the potential theoretic uh, approach. And it tries to, but it's, I think in my opinion, it's more suitable to answer the second question. It's, easy, it's more flexible to, to, to describe the, the effective dynamics because it uh, describes the effective di dynamics as a solution to a martingale problem. And uh, this way you, you understand how it is. In fact, uh, Joel talked about this uh, earlier this week. And uh, over the past uh, three or four years, I was going to say past couple of years, but I realized it was 18 already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there was some new approach which builds on the Martingale approach, uh, so to speak, by Freydun, uh, Chen Duo, uh, and Im Suk Seo, and uh, later by Landim, Marcondes, and Seo. And uh, there they use, um, they analyzed the, an associated uh, Poisson equation or a resolvent equation in a later uh, approach. And they try from there to, to deduce metastability. In the context of the zero range process, the first result was by Beltran and Landin. In fact, the zero range process was the paradigm for applying their uh, Martingale approach method. Okay, so the, the first uh, model that was treated with the Martingale approach was the zero range process uh, for a finite L and uh, reversible dynamics. Uh, Bouvier and Neukir uh, proved the same result using the potential theoretic approach and they uh, they could also uh, prove the result for a diverging number of sites, but with infinite density. And uh, again, using the Martingale approach, uh, Claudio treated the problem for the totally asymmetric case. And then the non-reversible case was done by CO and later using the Poisson equation by O and Freydun. And uh, recently there was a result for the critical case, B equals one, uh, using the Poisson or the resolvent equation. Um, by Landim, Mercondens, uh, in C. Of course, there are other results too. Uh, I should also mention a result by Paul about the finite size effects. The work I would like to talk here about uh, has to do with the diverging number of sites. So L goes to infinity, but the density will be finite. It just has to be supercritical as it, as it should. And also we are on dimension one and we are in a symmetric case. Okay, so. Uh, we have a discrete torus and particle jump left or right with probability one half. The method we are going, we used to prove the result was the Martingale approach. Just to introduce some notation for the result, we have a fast variable, which is the, the state. So as uh, Joel explained in his talk, it's convenient to consider the trace process relevant part of the state space. Okay, so the relevant part of the state space here is the union of these wells. Uh, we consider the trace process there, and then we have a function that keeps track of the well you are into, tells you where the, the state of the system is. Our fast variable is the actual state of the system. Our slow variable is the position of the condensate. Of course, it's a non-Markovian 
um, process, the position of the corners. And what we want to do is we want to find a suitable scale to observe. So this is the position of the corners, and we, we want to find the suitable scale to observe this motion in order to see something uh, interesting and to describe what the interesting part is. And the result is as follows. If B is bigger than 20, which is a, a strange and technical uh, um, requirement, uh, it should, the result should be true for a much smaller B. We're just not able to prove it. Um, and at time scale L to the one plus B, so this is the correct time scale, what happens is that the position of the condensate looks like a Levy process on the torch. Okay. And the generator of the Levy process is given here. And this constant there is uh, completely determined. So the rates of jump are um, the inverse of the distance between two sites. And the distance, we, uh, we, the relevant distance on the torus. So the relevant distance on the torus, if you have two points here on the torch, is the product of this length by this length. It's a, it's a distance. Okay. So just like in the case of um, Beltran and Andim for the discrete case, the rate of jump for the limiting process is the inverse of the capacity of the underlying walk. Okay. And we also prove that uh, the time that the system spends outside the relevant part of the space, outside the wells, is negligible uh, on the scale we look at the system. So let me just very briefly tell you the, the ideas of the of the proof without uh, any technical details. As I said, the method we used was the Martingale approach by Beltran and Dim. So this is a program basically. So you have to prove certain things. Uh, the first thing one has to prove is that the distribution of the process is tight. The, the, se the sequence of the distribution of the process is, is tight. Okay. So in order to prove tightness, one has to make sure that the process doesn't jump too much between different, uh, different uh, wells doesn't jump too soon between different wells okay so one needs uh, something like um, a, a uniform bound on the rate at which the process jumps from one well to the other okay. and in order to achieve this we use the coupling uh, of course I, I, I didn't mention but this the when g is decreasing uh, the zero range process is not an attractive system and it's not very easy to find a conventional coupling to 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 prove things so uh, what we, the coupling we used attaches to each, to each side, let's say a tree of, uh, of um, uh, birth and death chains. Okay. These birth and death chains are simple. They uh, die at the rate G of K, which is the correct rate. And they uh, give birth at rate one. Rate one is the average rate at which uh, sites receive particles at the critical fugacity. So uh, if you do this, you, you can do this in a way so that um, one of these uh, birth and death chains, sorry, all of these birth and death chains are uh, bigger than um, uh, the occupation at this site. Okay. So if you are going to see um, a condensate growing at a site that uh, was not there in the beginning, that means that one of these birth and death chains at the same time has to uh, make a, a very um, a large increase. Okay, so by comparing the time it takes for a birth and death chain to do this, we can get uh, estimates for the range process and, and we are able to get a uniform bound on the exit rate from a well. Okay. And this, this proves tightness. The second part is uh, to prove that any weak limit of this uh, sequence of distributions uh, has a property that characterizes it. And this, is proper, this property is a, a solution to a Martingale problem. Okay. So the, this Martingale problem will have a unique solution for the generator I described you earlier. So if we are able to prove that in the limit, uh, for, any, for any weak limit Q, uh, this quantity is a Martingale, then we are done. And as usual, we start with a, we start with a Martingale for our original process, the same, uh, story appeared also in uh, Joel's talk earlier. Uh, so we have the, the slow variable here that we want to describe, but unfortunately the Martingales we can write are expressed in terms of the fast variable. So we need to do some homogenization inside its well. And 
to do this homogenization, one basically has to prove that the mixing time within the well is much faster than the time it takes to jump, than the time scale that, that uh, the process jumps. Okay. So we do that again by compare, by proving um, uh, a Poincare inequality, and uh, we can get a, a bound on the mixing time for the process confined in the web. And from this, we can also get a bound on the mixing time for the process confined in the web. And uh, this allows to substitute the fast variable here by the slow variable, the position. So basically what you do is you substitute the, the local rates that you have at each configuration by the average rate that you have all over the, uh, the well. Okay, so normally at this point, uh, one proves a, a limit theorem for this quantity here, the, the um, form of the generator of the limiting process. Okay. That's the, what typically happens in the Martingale approach program. But, uh, okay, so how does one do this? Uh, for the reversible system, uh, it's convenient to use capacities. There are many uh, um, variation um, principles that characterize the capacities of sets. And you can express the rate of jump between uh, different uh, wells uh, through capacities between wells. Okay, so one has to do estimate of capacities in order to estimate the, the, the rates and see if there is a limit. The problem in this uh, case where L is diverging is that the quantity you have here is you have to subtract one big thing from another big thing and find the precise uh, scale, which is not the leading scale in each of these. Okay. So it's not, not, not uh, easy to do. And in fact, if you do it for um, individual wells, it is very hard and we could not, in fact, prove uh, the convergence of the rates. Okay. So one has to do first some coarse graining and uh, instead of looking at individual wells, one has to look at this formula for coarsened wells. So we take groups of wells together uh, of a mesoscale. Uh, each group has a diverging number of wells, but much smaller than uh, the system. And uh, if you do this for jumps between uh, coarse, coarsened wells, if you do this for this generator, you can prove that the limit exists and you get, in fact, the generator of the, uh, of the process on the torus, the levy process on the torus. Okay. So when you pass to the limit, this error term goes away, and you get that uh, any weak limit is indeed a solution to the Martingale problem, which characterizes the solution. So these are my collaborators. You can see Ines there. <laughs> in, uh, Stefan is explaining something about the inclusion process. <laughs> and thank you for your attention. Um, are there any questions? So wh where do you uh, need the assumptions on L larger than 20? B larger than 20. B larger than 20. Sorry. Okay. So uh, one, point that we, one point that we lose uh, accuracy is uh, at the estimating the mixing time within the well. We were able to prove um, a spectral gap of the order of L to the minus 4 for its well where in fact we expect it to be L to the minus two. If one fixes this, B bigger than 20 becomes bigger, B bigger than 13. Uh, but there is also a, a lack of accuracy at the coupling argument. The coupling argument uh, also is, um, uses a lot of room at, at the scale. So uh, if one can come up with a, an argument that gives a, a better estimate on the rate from jumping from one well to the other, then one could also improve B. It would be interesting, and it was proposed, in fact, in the papers written by the people who proposed the new approach with the Poisson and the resolvent equation, that if, if you use this new approach, looking at the uh, resolvent equation, say, instead, then perhaps one could uh, get better results for, for B, but nobody has done this. Are there any other questions? Okay, if not, let's um, thank uh, Mike again once. <laughs> I just wanted to thank all the organizers. Ah, for okay. The, I was going to do this. <laughs> Claudio, Alessandra, Paul, and Hubert who are not there for a fantastic two weeks. Thank you so much for all of us. And we know how much work this takes. And also thanks to Luigi and Jessica, you know, for the broader program. So, and thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you very much.
just wanted to take the opportunity to, yes. to thank the organizers and the staff of the university yes. that uh, was very helpful. Yes, thank yes, you. thank you very much indeed to Virginie, to all of you for this uh, tech support. It was really went very smoothly. Thank you.